<clears throat> All right, now in Acts chapter what, 8, verse number 1, we're picking right up where we left off in Acts chapter 7. Of course, Acts chapter 7 ends up with the, uh, Stephen being stoned and calling upon God. And then the people that were there, they threw their garments down at Saul's feet, who's later going to be the Apostle Paul. Saul was, uh, and we see here in verse number 1, and Saul was consenting unto his death, meaning that, you know, he was okay with it. He took their garments, he was going to hide it for them, and, and he was okay with it. He was consenting unto death. And not only that, and we see here in the first few verses, like look at verse number 3, it says, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. So he comes into the house, he says, Hey, how's it going? You know, and, and, and basically, you know, pretend to be like a believer and just get him to say, oh yeah, they believe in Christ. And then boom, they're arrested. So he's going around and he's doing this. And people are hearing about this, of course, because people are being arrested. So we see here in, um, it says at the end of verse number one, that, uh, or in the middle, look at, let's just read verse number one. It says, And Saul was contending on his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. So there's lots of persecution coming to him. They're being arrested. And it says, And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So basically, all the disciples and the, and the, and the followers, the church was basically just being scattered at this point. It says, except for the apostles. The apostles still stayed in Jerusalem. They still stayed there, even though there was all this persecution going on. And everyone else is basically just going out and being scattered about, abroad throughout the regions. And then it says, you know, right after we read there about Saul making havoc of the church in verse number four, it says, therefore, they that were, scat they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. So it didn't shut them up. But what it did was it forced them to go out into other places and to continue to preach the word. And you can't help but wonder if God was allowing this to happen because remember when Jesus Christ gave the great commission? We'll turn back real quick to Matthew chapter 28. Right near the end. Right at the end of Matthew 28, verse 19, he says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. He's teaching them here, look, you need to go out and preach the gospel to every creature. But what did they do? They weren't doing that. They all stayed in Jerusalem. They stayed where they were. No one was going out. So now we see Saul's coming in and bringing lots of persecution that scatters them and basically that forces them to go out and now they're going out and they're preaching the word. Um, it's just kind of interesting because you don't see the going out aspect until the church gets scattered here, until people actually start getting persecuted and they have to go out. But they still did what they were supposed to do because it says they went everywhere preaching the word. That didn't shut them up. That didn't stop them. Let's keep reading here. In verse number five, it says, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. So here we're going to see a, lot, a little bit about Philip. Philip was another great disciple, just like Stephen was. We saw earlier Stephen was a man. He was full of, he had a lot of miracles and was doing really good works, and the power of God was upon him. Philip's the same way here. Look at what Philip, it says about Philip. It says, um, you know, he was preaching Christ unto the city of Samaria. In verse number six, it says, And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. So he also was performing miracles. He also had the great power of God upon him to be able to do these great miracles. It says, For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. So he's, he's casting out devils, he's healing people, he's doing all these great miracles. And it says, and there was great joy in that city. So Philip is another great man of God that we see here. But look at verse number nine, it says, but there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city, so the same city where Philip's preaching right now, it says he used sorcery 
and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because at a long time he had bewitched them with sorcery. So in verse 9 and verse number 11, it's talking about this man named Simon. And in both verses it says that he was bewitching the people with his sorceries. Now, sometimes people today will, will try to mock the Bible. And it's mostly comes from the atheists and the God-haters and say, Oh yeah, sorcery and, and all this other stuff. And they'll, and they'll mock it and say, and just make it sound like it's a fairy tale, that it's not real. Sorcery is very real. Sorcery is still real today. And it says here, now I don't know all the specifics of how sorceries necessarily work. I know there's a lot of people out there today that, that they claim to talk with spirits. And, um, you know, you go to these, these um, my mind is failing me. The, the psychics, thank you, the, the psychics and these astrologers and all these people who claim they can see the future and they can talk to dead relatives, these people that passed on. Look, a lot of those people, I know they're charlatans and they're fakes and they're phonies and they're in it to make a buck. But some of those people, I believe, are they're real. They're really doing things. Now, I don't necessarily believe that they're talking to your loved ones, but I believe that they're talking to devils and to other demons and, and spiritual beings that are out there. I think they're really seeing things. I know that there's other stuff out there in this world. The Bible talks about spiritual warfare and it talks about angels. And there's, there's many places you can look in Daniel. You can look in other places where, you know, where, Dan, where um, you know, men prayed and then, you know, an angel is coming to help them, but they were, you know, resisted. The, the devil resisted them. And there's things going on. There's things going on in this world. And I think of the one story too with, um, I think it was with Elisha where um, they were surrounded by the enemy and it was just him and his servant. And he's like, and he asked God, he said, God, open up his eyes. And, and God opened up his eyes and he was able to see the host of angels surrounding them. So Elisha knew that they were not in trouble. Even though there was a great army surrounding them and encompassing them, Elisha knew he said, no. We're not in any danger. We're not in any trouble because God was protecting them because God sent a bunch of angels. And see, he had the faith to, to, to know that that was there. And he asked God to open up his servant's eyes so he could see. And he was able to look around about and actually see the angels that were there. There's a lot of things in this world that we can't physically see with our eyes. But it doesn't mean that they're not there. But see, here's the thing. We're commanded. We're not, we are not supposed to you know, use familiar spirits or or go to one who, who communicates with familiar spirits. The Bible um, gives these commandments. Actually, in um, Exodus 22, 18, the Bible says, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. And in Leviticus 20, 27, the Bible says, A man also or a woman that hath a familiar spirit, or that is a wizard, shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones, their blood shall be upon them. See, the Bible is against all of it. The sorceries, the witchcraft, the familiar spirits. And see, this man in this story, he was using this sorcery as a way to trick them. He was deceiving them. He was bewitching them into thinking that he had some great power of God and that, you know, everyone held him in regard saying, oh man, this guy can do... And if you think about it, he probably was able to do some tricks just like the, the, um, the astrologers and the wise men of Pharaoh were able to do when Moses came and he was able to throw his, his rod on the ground and became a serpent. Well, if you remember, um, Pharaoh's wise men were able to do the same thing. They were able to cast their, their rod on the ground and became a serpent. But the difference was Moses' serpent ate theirs and destroyed them. But see, they were able to perform some of the things that Moses was able to do. Because they were using sorceries. They were using enchantments. They were using these things that God told us not to use. He, Moses was doing it by the power of God. They were not. But these things are real. These things exist. And see, this is, this is the type of stuff, though, that today gets glorified. People, people magnify this. And it's even being sold to our children. When you think of things like Harry Potter is a perfect example. I mean, we just read 
I'll read it again. In Leviticus 20, 27, it says, A man also or a woman that hath a familiar spirit, or that is a wizard, shall surely be put to death. Now, what is Harry Potter? He's supposed to be a wizard, isn't he? I mean, he's going to that school, and, and it's all about, you know, making potions and casting spells and, and magic and doing all this stuff and using all this witchcraft. Then he's, oh, no, no, but it's for good. The Bible doesn't differentiate using witchcraft for good or for evil. It just says don't do it at all. And it says if you're a wizard, you shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. The Bible doesn't joke about this stuff, and it doesn't portray it in a light, in a, in a positive sense, ever. Not only is it with Harry Potter, but it's with basically all of Disney. All the Disney movies, all that stuff out there. I mean, you think about how many of the Disney movies have witches in them. I mean, just about all of them do. And you think about like Aladdin and the magic lamp and all this stuff. It's all this magic stuff and, and garbage that the Bible is saying it's wicked and to stay away from it. And then you think about too, not just with Disney and not just with Harry Potter, not just in the movies, but what about video games? There's games even that I used to play that I liked where... It's a role-playing game, and you can pick to be a wizard, and you're casting spells, and you're killing monsters, and you're doing all this stuff. It's ungodly. We ought not to be getting our pleasure and our entertainment from that. Um, and, and that is, in, in the like computer game world, that is just a balance, this type of the magic and the sorceries and the spells and all this stuff. And the Bible says that was worthy of the death penalty. That is not something we as Christians should be associating ourselves with today. Now, I'd also heard, as we're on the subject of sorcery, because this guy Simon here was a sorcerer, and he was, he was deceiving people. I mean, that's what he did as a sorcerer. He was deceiving the people and, letting them, and making them think that he was some high, powerful guy, and he was, you know, they had him in regard. Now, I had heard somewhere that, that sorcery is tied in with drug use. And um, basically the, where that comes from is, is people say, based on the etymology of the word sorcery, that the Greek, one of the Greek words that's used for sorcery is pharmakia, or pharmakia, I don't know how to pronounce it. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's like the word pharmacy, right? So it's the same root word, and it is, it's the same root word where obviously our pharmacy is a drugstore, and it's, it's a place where drugs are administered, and um, now, <clears throat> there's other root words. I'm not, I don't have like some, some dogmatic view on this, on this issue because I don't know it completely, but, um, I do think it's interesting because it does kind of make sense to me that the sorcery can include the use of drugs because you think about all the false religions of the world, for example, that incorporate drug use in order to contact the spirit world, right? In order to get in, in tune with that spirit world. You think about the Native American religion, that they use a peyote, and the African tribes, and the people that, that practice voodoo. And I know there's others I'm not mentioning, but a lot of these false religions, they, they use the music, the, 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 heavy, the heavy rhythm, the heavy beat, and these drugs to induce themselves into these trances and these states where they're like, Communicating with, with spirits is what they would say. So it doesn't surprise me that, that someone who uses sorcery, and I mean, you think about, just, just from what you hear about a wizard and a sorcerer, they're probably making potions, and, and it's not, um, and, and they're probably using some of these herbs and some of these other things that have these hallucinogenic effects, and that they're able to use this on people. And, and give it to people and tell them, hey, this is going to help you. This is going to open up your mind. You're going to be capable of a lot more things. And they take it. And they're thinking, wow. And they start getting high or whatever. And they start feeling the effects of these drugs. Well, the man who gives you that is the sorcerer. And he could, I'm sure, um, you know, he'll, he has a, you'll have a view of that person. You know, the shaman or whatever, people viewed that person in high regard. The, the medicine man, the guy who, who had the drugs in these religions, they looked up to that person the same way they looked up to this Simon. So, now do I think sorcery always has to include drug use? I don't think so. But I can see where, where the, that tie can be made 
and can be used in them. And I'll tell you what, drugs, I like that it, I like that it's the word pharmacy because the drugs that are at the pharmacy are drugs. People tend to have a, this, this notion of drugs that it's only street drugs, that it's only like heroin and marijuana and um, cocaine, like those are drugs. But when you go down to, to CVS or when you go down to Walgreens and pick up your prescription, that those aren't really drugs. Like it's just this separation of what they are. It's nonsense. The majority of those drugs, especially the painkillers, I mean, those things are no better than, than the street drugs that you're getting anyways. And where do you think that they're all derived from the same place? I mean, the, the heroin and the opium and all your barbiturates and the things that you get for your, for your um, pain relief are coming from the same plants, essentially. I mean, they're not exactly the same makeup, but they're all drugs. And I don't recommend using just about any of them. Now, what's interesting here is so we're going to see what happens with Simon. Let's continue on in the story in the book of Acts with Simon. Because Simon here was a sorcerer, and it was totally wrong for him to do it. He was deceiving the people. But you see, when Philip came, Philip preached the truth. Philip, Philip preached Jesus Christ. Even though they thought that Simon was some great guy, and that he was of God, and he had all this power, when they heard what Philip preached, when they heard the truth, they received it. They were able to receive it still and believe. Look at verse number 12. It says, But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So they gave up this notion, whatever, whatever Simon was teaching, and they believed on Christ, and they got saved. Now look at what it says in verse 13. It says, Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now, real quick, is Simon saved? Based on what we just read in verse number 13, what does it say? It says, then Simon himself believed also. Is there any doubt here that Simon's, Simon's not saved? Now look, it doesn't say then Simon said that he believed or professed that he believed. The, the narrator of the Bible here in Acts chapter 8, talking about Simon as a third person, says, then Simon himself believed also. Simon truly believed. And this is going to be important in just a minute. We're going to get to this. But I want to point out this verse because it's really critical. Because there's false doctrine being taught and people go to this chapter teaching that Simon wasn't saved and teaching other stuff. The Bible says that Simon also believed. Just as all the other people believed in, the verse, in verse 12, the verse right before that. All the other people believed and were baptized. He heard about it too. He said, hey, I believe that. Look at verse 14. It says, Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Now, when it's talking here about receiving the Holy Ghost, it's not talking about the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, because you get that the moment that you believe. But what it says here, we'll, show, we'll see that in just a second. They're talking about the power of the Holy Ghost. See, when they laid their hands on people, they received the power of the Holy Ghost. That's when they had the power to go out and heal people and cast out devils and do these great works um, because they, were, they had the Holy Ghost, the power of the Holy Ghost upon them. And um, it says in verse 16, it says, For as yet he was fallen upon none of them. It wasn't that he wasn't indwelling them. It says he was fallen upon none of them. Only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Verse 18, And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Now, let's continue reading here. Verse number 19, Saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost, but Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. 
Now, this is the point where people that believe a false gospel are going to try to point to this to say, see, you have to repent of your sins in order to be saved. Or that you have to show some kind of works in order to prove that you were really saved. Now, we're going to go through this step by step because first of all, should Simon have asked to get that power of laying on his hands to give the Holy Ghost by, by paying money for it? Of course not. That's why he was rebuked. But does that make him not saved? We just saw in verse 13 that Simon believed and he was baptized. I mean, Simon believed. He put his faith in Christ. That's all you have to do to be saved. Now, the reason why people look at this is because they'll say, well, look at verse 21. It says, Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. And say, how can he be saved? And then them tell him that he has no part or lot in this matter. Because he has no part or lot in giving of the Holy Ghost, is what they're saying. Because he wanted to have the power to give the Holy Ghost to other people so that when he laid his hands on them, then they could have the power of the Holy Ghost on them too. But he was trying to receive that power by using money, which was totally the wrong way to do it. And it was wicked. But his not having a part of lot in that matter was, was he wasn't going to receive that power. He's trying to do it the wrong way. His heart wasn't right. Okay, you can be saved many times and your heart's not right with God. I mean, that happens all the time. That's why we continue to sin. Because when our heart's not right with God, then we're going to sin. We're going to do things that are wrong. When we're not walking in the spirit, we're going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. Verse 22. Now, I mean, I would think that this shows the exact opposite. I can't understand how anyone would use this scripture to show that you need to repent of your sins in order to be saved. Because here we see a man, he's saved already in verse 13, and then in verse 22, they're telling him, repent therefore of this thy wickedness. Now, if you have to repent of your wickedness in order to be saved, then how is it that Simon believed and got saved, and then he had to repent of his wickedness? Because repenting of your wickedness is something that Christians ought to be doing. Repenting of your sins Turning from your sins and not doing them anymore is something that you should be doing, but it's not a requirement for salvation. It says, And pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee, for I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. This is not talking about his eternal salvation. This is talking about him just getting back right with God after he's sinned. Okay, we all need to do this. When you sin, you ought to humble yourself and pray to God and just ask Him, you know, ask Him to forgive you. Ask Him, you know, just tell Him that you're sorry. Tell Him you didn't mean to do it or whatever. And go back to God and humble yourself and tell Him that you're sorry. This is something that, does that mean you're going to go to hell if you don't do it? No, because you're eternally saved. But that is something that God wants you to do. God, God expects you to go to Him and pray so He can forgive you right there. And then, and then you know, you're not necessarily going to reap even on this earth, the things that, that you've sown, if you go to him and he can show mercy on you. Now, let's continue out of the story here in verse number 24. The Bible says, Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning, and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself. To this chariot. Now here, this is the story that's coming to us of the of the Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Now, just in case you don't know, I'm going to explain briefly what a eunuch is. Because I had to have this taught to me because it's not a word that's very familiar in our language today. So in Matthew 19, 12, there's a there's a pretty good understanding of what a eunuch is. And uh, I'll just read it for you. Matthew 19, 12 says. Jesus was saying, For there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. Now, 
basically what a eunuch is, 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 a, is a man who's no longer able to have children because that capability has been removed from him. That's what a eunuch is. They're not able, he's not able to reproduce. And I'll leave it at that. But that's what Jesus was saying. Some people, from their mother's womb, that's how they're born. They're, they're unable, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're unable to do that. They, they have this problem. That's the way they were. And it says there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men. Meaning that people, someone did that to them. And then it says there's some which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. Now, this is something that's it's hard for us to understand today, I think. But um, back in that time, see, there's there are certain positions that people held that were specifically like eunuchs. So like this man was the um, he was a eunuch, but he was a eunuch of great authority under Candace, Queen of the Ethiopians. He had the charge of all her treasure and had um, come to Jerusalem for a worship. So he was someone, and I can't say specifically like that was a requirement for that position, but there was definitely positions within the royalty and within different places where you had to be a eunuch in order to have that position. And um, I think that might be one of the reasons why, why that happened and why other men would make that so. But in any case, not that pertinent to this story. Just wanted to give you a brief explanation of what a eunuch is. It says, so then um, what we see here in the story, that, you know, this eunuch, he was returning to Ethiopia. He had already gone to Jerusalem to worship. And um, he's on his way back home. So here was a man, he had the right God. He, was, he went to Jerusalem to worship God. You know, he was trying, he was even reading his Bible. But this man was not saved. Like so many people today, they go to Christian church. You know, they have they they they, they have Jesus in a, in a sense. Like they know um, they, they're they're going to try to to please Jesus. But a lot of people just aren't saved. A lot of people read their Bibles and they try and they try to do what's right, but they just they they don't understand the gospel or whatever. And they haven't really put their faith on Christ to save them. Just like this man. Now it says here that. Um, you know, that of course Philip is on his way as the angel of the Lord had told him. He was on his way to go to, um, it says, to go unto Gaza. So the Spirit of the Lord tells Philip, he's like, look, I need you to go, or the angel of the Lord tells him to go, go up from Jerusalem and go unto Gaza. So Philip's on his way, he sees his chariot, and then the Spirit not the angel of the Lord, but the Spirit tells Philip to go near and join himself to this chariot. Now this story is a great example of how we can see how God's plans for our lives sometimes can unfold. See, Philip didn't know why he was going where he was going. He didn't know why he was told to go to Gaza. He was just told to go to Gaza. Okay? And what's funny is he never even ends up in Gaza. The Spirit takes him away and, and drops him somewhere else. So... God's, God has a plan, and God had this plan for Philip to talk to this Ethiopian eunuch right here. And I also like that he didn't resist the Holy Spirit because it was the Spirit that told him, hey, go join yourself near unto that chariot. How many times have you been told by the Spirit to go, hey, go give that guy the gospel. You see someone, hey, go, go talk to that person right there. But you resist it. And for whatever, if out of fear or, or whatever, you just, no, I don't want to do that. You feel uncomfortable with something, you'll go do it. Who knows what God has planned? See, we can't be quenching our spirit. We, we shouldn't be resisting our spirit. When, when you know, I mean, when the Spirit's telling you to do something like give the gospel, I mean, it's not going to be an audible voice in your ear telling you, go give that person the gospel. But I know from experience, I've seen people, I've just been, you know, you can be outside doing chores, you can be at the store, you can be at the gas station, you can be in different situations. And something happens where maybe someone comes like real close by and you'll think like, hey, I should go give that person the gospel. This is a great opportunity. 
I think that's the Spirit leading you to do that. And I know personally, I've, I've, there have been times where I have resisted the Spirit and I didn't do it. And there's been other times where I have done it. And the amazing thing is, like, when those situations come up, the vast majority of the times when you actually listen and go and do it, like, it's, it's, it's uncanny how many times I've seen people get saved as a result. And, and it's not even necessarily a result of going out, like, at the soul winning time. This is just random times when you know, like, you know, whatever it may be. I mean, there's so many different instances. I mean, he, Philip was on his way to go, to just to go to Gaza, and there's a ch chariot coming by. So he was like, hey, go, go up to that guy. Now, he could have resisted, and then this guy probably would have never gotten saved. I mean, definitely wouldn't have gotten saved here. But I love his response to the Spirit. Look at verse number 30. It says, and Philip ran thither to him. He didn't walk. He didn't saunter over there. He ran to him. He picked up and he booked. He, he made it over to that chariot and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? Now, this is a great verse and, and I know that this is an unsaved man speaking these words, but there's still some truth here because we need to explain the gospel to people. People can read the Bible all day long, but they're not going to get saved just by reading the Bible. You need to expound it to them. You need to explain to them. That's why the Bible says that God has committed unto us the ministry of the reconciliation. It's our job, as in Christ said, as the ambassadors of Christ, to go out and preach the gospel. The Bible says, how they shall, shall they believe on him in whom they have not heard? And how, they, how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? So here's the thing. It's, he puts part of salvation in our responsibility, in our, in our arena to go out and do this. It's not just a matter of picking up the Bible and reading God's word. You need to hear it preached. You need to hear it explained by someone in order to receive it. It's just the way that God made it. So what he was saying here was right. How can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. Verse 32, the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man. Now, I'm sorry, but you can't ask for a much better opportunity than this to give someone the gospel. I mean, he walks up to the chariot, he runs up to the chariot, he hears him reading the Bible. The guy's reading Isaiah out loud. And he just asks him, hey, do you understand what you're reading? The guy says, no. He invites him up. And he, and he points to this scripture, which is like, I mean, in the book of Isaiah, this is probably one of the absolute best verses that you can possibly even be at to, to expound the, God, the you know, Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ, using this scripture, the this, this scripture that he was at. And he's asking him, you know, who speaks the prophet this, of himself or of someone else? And that's exactly what Philip does. And Philip, um, you know, explains to him, it says in verse 35, then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. So it was a perfect opportunity. And one of the things we can learn from this, is, hey, don't waste opportunities that come your way to give the gospel. I mean, you can look at this and say, oh, this man just happened to be reading one of the best portions of scripture possible, but... I don't think it was a coincidence. God had it all lined up. God had it planned. God knows the future. I mean, God knows the things that are going to happen. That's why in advance, he had told Philip to go to Gaza. That's why the Spirit told him to go and join himself unto the chariot. And it just worked out in this perfect timing where he was able to get the, give him the gospel and this guy gets saved. Now, let's look at verse number 36. We're almost done. But there's one major point that I'm going to point out here. Look at verse number 36. It says, And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? So Philip, he preaches the gospel to him. He preaches him Jesus. They're, they're traveling on their way. They see some water. The eunuch, he says, hey, Look, hey, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? That's what he's saying. What the hinder me to be baptized? Why can't I be baptized? 
And that's a great question. Hey, why can't I be baptized? You know what? Let's find out. Let's find out what the answer is. Sebastian, do you mind looking up Acts chapter 8 in this not inspired version for me? See, we got the NIV here tonight. And I've got the, the good news or the bad news Bible here that was given to me actually when I was a child in the, the Presbyterian church. You know, because as a child, you, you can't really understand the Bible, so they need to tone it down for you and just remove some verses and change things up on you. Let me know when you get to Acts chapter 8. Because in verse 36, we saw, what, why can't I be baptized? There's water right there. Why can't I be baptized? That was verse 37. So you want, you want to read verse 38 for me of Acts chapter 8? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down. What the verse is that? 38. Is that what it says? No, 37. Yeah, it says 38. It says 36. And oh, I'm sorry. Read verse 37. There is no 37. What? There's no verse 37? Huh. Well, yeah, because verse 38, you're right, it says that he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both in the water, so it doesn't sound like he answered his question, does it? Mm -hmm. He says, hey, why can't I be baptized? Well, if you're reading the NIV, it goes verse 36 and then verse 38. You know what? Look at that. The Bad News Bible does the exact same thing. He says in verse 36, here is some water. What is to keep me from being baptized? It's a great question. Oh, look. Verse 38, the official ordered the carriage to stop, and both Philip and the official went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. Now, this is, I'll read it out of the King James for you, because it actually keeps the verse in there. And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Don't tell me that these Bibles are just trying to make it easy for us to understand and taking the these and the thous away. Because what this verse does, this makes it, this is one of the best verses, not the only verse, but this is one of the most clear-cut verses that explains that in order for a person to get baptized, you have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ first with all your heart. This destroys the false doctrines of infant baptisms that are rampant in the Catholic Church and many other religions. And, oh yeah, myself included, I was, I was a Presbyterian. I was baptized as a baby too. Catholic light. Babies don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't know anything. They don't know what to believe. This verse has been stripped out, yet they'll tell you, oh no, here, here, read this. You can't understand the King James Version. You, you need this for your simple little mind to understand like what I was what I was given when I was a child. And then you got the, the, the not inspired version, one of the most popular versions out there. Nope, they just remove it. We're gonna take one of the one of the strongest verses on being baptized. But you know, it's it's not some major doctrine or anything, you know, the doctrine of baptism. Oh yeah, those minor changes that they make between the different versions. You hear people say all the time, oh, but that doesn't really affect major doctrine. They're just making it easier to read. Yeah. Baloney. In fact, the NIV, that non inspired version, removed 16 entire verses out of the New Testament, just completely gone. And you tell me, I'm not going to read them all. My throat is killing me. Tell me if some of these sound important to you. Like the ones where he's explaining hell, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched, Mark 9.44, or Mark 9.46, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched, describing hell. Just removing a little bit of the fire from hell, removing the worms from hell. <clears throat> John 5.4 always kills me because... This is a story, I don't, I don't want to get into this too much. It says, for an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had made. Yeah, the entire verse is gone. All those words I just read, gone. But what's funny about that is you read that story and you wonder, why were these people crowding around this pool? 
And why was this lame man trying to get in there and be healed? Well, those false words, the NIV won't be able to explain that to you. You have no idea. That doesn't even make any sense. Because they removed the entire verse explaining that, hey, an angel went in here, and then the first person that got in was healed. Just completely removes that. You have no understanding what's going on in that story and why they were in, at that pool to begin with. Of course, Acts 8.37, we just read, just gives us this perfect explanation of, um, of baptism. <clears throat> and then what's also removed is in 1 John, is 1 John 5, 7, which is, <clears throat> for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. I'm going to get to this in just a minute because that is the doctrine of the Trinity. And if you don't think that that's, that's an important doctrine, then you're fooling yourself. These Bibles are out here to deceive. These false perversions, where they've twisted God's word, they've removed from God's word, they've added to God's word, they're of the devil, they're of Satan, and they're out to deceive. They're out to cause confusion. They're out to get the people out there, the, the lost people of the world, that just say, man, I, and one of the girls I was talking to just tonight, she said, I don't know what to believe. You're coming here and you, 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 know, you tell me something about the Bible. Someone else comes last week. There's all these different Bibles. There's all these different churches. And they're all saying different things. What am I supposed to believe? The devil is winning with people like that. Because he's making it confusing. The devil is the author of confusion. That's why he has all these stinking Bibles out here. These versions just to confuse people. And just, and just so people don't know what to believe. I don't know what to believe. They say two different things. Not only does the NIV remove 16 entire verses, not to mention all the phrases and portions of Scripture that it removes, it makes Jesus a sinner. Now here's a test. If you have a Bible that contradicts itself from its own words, see, I think you could compare the King James to these other versions and, and figure out pretty quick which one's the fraud and which one's real. But if you have a version, if you have a Bible version and you can open it up and you can find stark contradictions within the pages of, this, of its own pages, you've got a serious problem. Matthew 5.22 in the NIV says, But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Rekha, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. But in Mark 3, 5 of the NIV, talking about Jesus, it says, He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. So Matthew 5, 22 says, But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Making Jesus subject to judgment because he was angry. And people will use that verse in Matthew 5, 22, that use NIV to say, look, it's a sin to be angry. Well, if it's a sin to be angry, then you just made Jesus Christ a sinner. Whereas the King James rightly says, but I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. You see how one little phrase, without a cause, makes a world of difference in the meaning, the actual meaning of the verse? You say, oh, well, it means basically the same thing. No, it doesn't. That puts a condition on there, whereas the other one has zero conditions on it. That changes the fact that that changes Jesus Christ from being sinless into being a sinner. That is a contradiction within the pages of the NIV itself. That's not good enough for you. How about this one? The NIV says in John 3:13, "No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man." The NIV says no one has ever gone into heaven in John 3.13. But you know what the NIV says in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11? Yeah, the Old Testament way before John 3. It says, as they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. So which is it, NIV? Did Elijah go to heaven or has no one ever gone into heaven? It's a contradiction. Again, the 
King James Version says in John 3.13, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Oh yeah, by the way, that IV removes that part, which is in heaven. Which again, just further solidifies the fact that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh, because Jesus Christ not only was on the earth as the Son of Man, he was also in heaven at the same time because he is God in the flesh. And the deity of Christ is just being attacked in the NIV. But the, but the King James says, no man hath ascended up into heaven. So ascending of, like basically of your own power, right? Ascending up. Jesus Christ, when he came out of hell, he ascended up into heaven. He wasn't taken up to heaven in a chariot like Elijah was. He actually ascended into heaven of his own power. You say, well, why do you make such a big deal out of this? Let me ask you this. If you're going to base and stake your eternity on a book and on the, the writings of, of, of ancient texts, you better make sure you have the right one. I know I'm not going to take that chance. I'm going to make sure I have the right book. And if you have a book with clear contradictions in it, like we just saw out of the NIV, that is not of God. God does not contradict himself. God is, is pure. God is true. God is truth and in him. There's no darkness in him. God is not a liar. God is not going to contradict himself. We need to have his preserved word. Here's another reason why it's so important. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Now, you think that, that the word is just some random name that's given to Jesus Christ? Just the word. Uh, what name should I give him? Oh, the word. It's just, just completely meaningless. No, it's the Word, because he's saying it's the Word of God. Jesus Christ is the Word made flesh. That's why it says in John 1, 14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. God's Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And I, I got to this verse earlier, 1 John 5, 7, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And the NIV just says, for there are three that testify, and that's it for verse 7. And then it, it basically cuts verse 7 and verse 8 in half and merges the two together. And it just says the spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement, which is more similar to, to verse 8 in uh, the King James, but not it, it completely removes the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. The Bible says in Revelation 19, 13, it says, And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Revelation 19, 13. This is why I take this so seriously. The Word of God. We need to make sure that we have the Word of God, the true Word of God. Because here's the thing. If you don't have the right word, you don't have the right Jesus. Just as much as Jesus Christ is necessary to be saved, you have to put your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. You need the word to be saved. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The word was made flesh. So you say, do you worship the Bible? Do you worship this book? Yes, I do. Not the physical bindings and pieces of paper, but I worship Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the embodiment of the words contained in this book. That's how God's word was made flesh. That's why his name is called the word of God. That's why we need to have a perfect Jesus to pay for our sins. That's why we need to have a perfect Bible to hear and believe on. Jesus saith unto, them, unto him in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 6, 63 says, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. In one verse, Jesus Christ is saying, I am the life. And in the other verse, he's saying, The words that I speak unto you, they are life. Because they're inseparable. Jesus is the word made flesh. Jesus spoke the word of God. Jesus embodied the word of God. Jesus was the word of God. You need the word of God to be saved. You need Jesus Christ to be saved. This is why I make such a big deal out of it. 
Because this is God. You know what this nonsense says in the book of Mark? I just saw this yesterday. I, I don't open these things except to show people how phony and false they are. Because, you know, the book of Mark, all these new updated versions are going to tell you that Basically, they're going to tell you that the book of Mark should stop after about verse number 8 or 9. And the whole rest of it, it's just, it just doesn't make sense. So, and it's, this is, you want to talk about confusing? I'll show this to you after the service. You check this out. <clears throat> Mark chapter 16, you know, they, they have this stuff in paragraph form. And then they give you verses 9 through 20 in those brackets to just already start causing doubt and they have all the foot, footnotes and stuff. And then after it finishes, verse 20, it says, another old ending. Another old ending? And it gives you a different verse 9 and 10. And then as a footnote, it says, some manuscripts and ancient translations have this shorter ending to the gospel in addition to the, long, to the longer ending. How could they both be an ending? It says, that doesn't even make any sense. It's not even saying that they replace an ending. It says some, some texts have this ending and that ending. Yeah, I'm, trying, I'm still trying to understand it too. I don't get it. It's stupidity. This thing's garbage. You need to, to burn those versions. Get yourself a King James Bible. God's word is perfect just as much as Jesus Christ is perfect. You need a sinless Jesus to save, your, to save you from your sins. You need a perfect Bible. And we have one. God promised to preserve his word throughout all generations. And he has done it. We have it today in the English language. And he's kept it for us perfectly. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for your word. God, I thank you for your son, the embodiment of your word. Lord, I, I pray that... Uh, you would help us never to back down on such an important issue because this, this boils right down to people's salvation, dear Lord. We need to have your word. We don't need to have man or Satan's counterfeit of your word. We need your words, dear God. The, you said that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. I believe we have every mouth that proceed out of the mouth of God. I believe you've given that to us and didn't just give us a commandment that would be inherently impossible. Lord, I thank you for the Bible. I thank you for preserving it. I pray that you would please help us to show others the truth and the truth in your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.